Right, hello, greetings. It's uh, Dr. Tom Staffan here for my Sunday fasting day talk. And today is um, the amazing 8th of November, which is the day after the results of the American election have finally become known. And we know that uh, Biden has won. I'm going to start with a song um, to uh, lead into this talk. It's time for a reckoning. Sheshat, and you know the mathematics of the count and all that. As you, some of you know, I'm writing a book on mathematics and religion. Each day I do my daily quota of work, and in the last few days I've been encountering Sheshat, who was the Egyptian goddess of mathematics. Um, which, you know, amazing really. I mean, these ancient Egyptians were quite clever, and, and they designated her as the wife of Thoth. Thoth has always been one of my intellectual heroes when I discovered Hermeticism and the whole European Hermetic uh, Renaissance D, the Elizabethan stuff, you know, sitting in the Warburg reading Francis Yates' works and sitting in the British Library reading D's original writings and stuff. Um, falling in love with, with Thoth, right? <clears throat> and then, lo and behold, his wife's the goddess of maths. So I think that's really cool. And uh, she's long neglected. Maths departments around the country and the world getting away with murder because they don't ever mention her. Uh, I think if kids realise that mathematics is actually a gift from the goddess to mankind, they might take it, you know, they might be able to A, do it better, B, not be so frightened of it, um, <clears throat> and enjoy it more. It's a game. It's like Maya. Um, and... Uh, but it's very important because it, it, you know, governs number, it governs um, 
money. It governs our economic anxieties as a planet. It governs, um, you know, countless fields of mathematics. So that's why I'm, I'm doing a sort of fight back. René Gaynor tried in his work The Reign of Quantity, but he didn't quite succeed. I'm trying to sort of update that and say, no, so we can't just get rid of number. We can't pretend it's not important. But we can rehumanize it. We can re-spiritualize it. We can claim number four philosophy, metaphysics, and religion. We can put soul back into number. And the more I look into it, the more I discover amazing people like George Boole, uh, an Irish mathematician from Cork, where my ancestors partly came from. Um, you know, he was trying to do the same thing. He was trying to find the laws of thought. Um, he wrote a book on that, which are the basis of, of computing still to this day. I mean, he was a 19th century Victorian mathematician, philosopher, and logician, um, <clears throat> and an extraordinary man. And one of his descendants was, was a peace activist in America, um, who's, who's no longer with us, sadly, but she would be jumping for joy, I think, at the election results, as would all peace activists. Um, <clears throat> although, you know, um, one shouldn't be naive and think that the Democratic Party is going to convert into a pacifist party. No. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let me let me come to that shortly. Um, so look, like everyone, I've been on tenterhooks the last few days about the American results. Oh dear, praying for um, you know common sense, right reason, and praying to the, <laughs> the goddess of mathematics, you know, to to come up with the count. And it's amazing to watch actually how, yeah, to see democracy in action actually working for a change. I think I compare it with Belarusia, where we had a recent election where, you know, they don't even bother to do the count. I mean, it's preordained, the president wins by, you know, vast amounts. Um, it'd be very interesting to see if, if Belarusia had an effective counting system like the USA has, and the election was rerun, you know, what would the actual results be? I think it's incredibly important that countries have a robust non-tamperable with counting system. I, I, I no longer have confidence in the UK's counting system, um, having discovered that the counting machines are, are owned by Tories. Um, they own the companies that own them. I think that should be outlawed under the Electoral Commission's laws. You know, I don't know what Labour and the Lib Dems are doing, why they're not robustly protesting this. I mean, you can't, you can't let that happen, or the um, you know, who owns the, the medium of, of decision-making owns the result. <clears throat> but anyway, I, I hats off to America that it got it together, that it, that it you know, has withstood the kind of madness of people wanting to stop the count or trying to, you know... I mean, apparently in Pennsylvania, one t uh, there was a, like a bomb threat. They were going to bomb the place to stop the count. Fortunately, you know, it hasn't happened. Um... And so we, we watched around the planet with bated breath, and um, eventually the results have come, come through and have uh, been called, as they call it in America, for, for the Democrat Party and all that that represents. So I watched the speech, the um, you know, kind of acceptance speech, effectively, by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris last night, um, I found it very moving, I have to say, as I think millions of other people around the planet and in America especially would have done. Um, <clears throat> I found Kamala Harris's speech extremely intelligent. She's an amazing woman um, and very articulate, highly, obviously highly educated, but very profound, very thoughtful and very soulful. And she spoke really from the heart as well as the mind. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, on behalf of all women, and she, she rehearsed the struggle it's taken women to get the vote in America. It wasn't for the first, you know, century or two allowed. Yet there have been so many amazing American women. Um, I've been honoured to know a few in my time. Um, my uncle lived in Philadelphia, and he was married to uh, a Swedish-American woman. And they, you know, when I was a little baby, we used to go and visit there for holidays and things. Um, and I've travelled around America, I've, I've known some amazing American women uh, who've been my teachers, mentors, and 
sometimes even girlfriends, you know, um, unbelievably intelligent and, uh, you know, profound women. And it was just amazing to hear Kamala Harris speaking on behalf of all American women that finally a woman has reached the office of vice president. It's incredible to think it's never happened before, you know. And then, in addition, the first black um, vice president ever. So it's like a double whammy. And the first from a South Asian descent. I don't know the details of that. Um, she, she may be from a, I don't know, or originally Hindu immigrants or something. Uh, you know, I would love to know. But she's a, she seems like an amazing woman. And um, I think she'll be a great vice president. So congratulations to her. And then Joe Biden's speech again, um, you know, it's, it's from the heart, it's, it's his, he's, he's developed this kind of way of speaking, which, which appeals, I think, to, to mainstream America, as well as to the progressive, democratic, uh, liberal element of America. Um, he's, you know, which is what you have to do to win the presidential vote. It's what, uh, you know, a, a, a similar candidate will have to do in Britain to win the vote because if you only appeal to a sort of um, extreme left wing Bernie Sanders type thing you're not going to get elected which is the problem with Corbyn much as one can respect many of his policies and him personally um, it created the chance for the right to then you know try and claim the centre ground which they failed miserably because they're so obviously extreme right that Starmer and um, you know, the Lib Dems need to get together and re recolonize the central ground in British politics. I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to finish off by just saying, um, yeah, I was deeply moved again by Joe Biden. Um, coincidentally, um, I'm a great lover of synchronicities. As a Druid, I tend to watch and I keep actually a record of synchronicities in my life. And, um, you know, I have notebooks for the purpose and I've clocked over several hundred which I think are interesting because it's the way time and space bend with consciousness as the, you know, the fourth dimension. Um, uh, relativity theory needs updating to include consciousness. And um, in my book on religious mathematics, I'm, I'm projecting a time when the laws of relativity will be updated to include the spirit, if you want. I think synchronicities are, are a sort of a sign or a clue that that things are happening, shifting in the spiritual world and in the, the world of time and space, normal coordinates. Um, anyway, so just to say that I've been working on, on my commentary on the Quran, as some of you know, in depth. Um, extraordinary, you know, um, verses that I'm going through and I'm not holding punches if I if I find you know, I'm, I'm pointing out what I hope are the interesting historical and critical features of the Quran. I'm treating it as a historical document, as a 19th century scholar of the Bible treated the Bible. And <clears throat> I'm sort of saying we need to look at this document using all the apparatus of scholarship, of archaeology, of historical studies, chronology, uh, linguistics, um, intellectual history transpersonal history, which is the concept I've coined, which is looking at history through spiritual lens. Um, you know, modern psychological theories about consciousness and altered states of consciousness. You know, what kind of state was Muhammad in when he was receiving these downloads? How do we know where they came from? I'm asking these critical questions. So it's the first in-depth philosophical, critical, historical commentary I think that's ever been attempted on the Quran. Um, I'm doing it as a labour of love because I, I love the good aspects of Islam. I've, I've taught at Islamic institutions. I've known great Islamic philosophers and, and teachers who've been my mentors and friends and colleagues over the years. And I'm trying to come at the thing from that holistic perspective. Anyway, at the moment I'm working on the commentary on, on Surah 12, which is called Yusuf, about the history of Joseph. And it retells... A story very similar to the biblical story, uh, which is in Genesis, of how Joseph, you know, saves Israel actually from destruction. Joseph's an under under underappreciated character in the history of religions. He's sacred in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. 
I think he's not emphasized enough in Judaism. Um, he's important in Christianity because, because he's an incredibly important figure. And he's also given his name to the father of Christ, who must have had some interesting stories to tell. You know those things that come on Facebook, like who do you want to spend a, an evening meal with? I think Joseph, you know, um, the father of Christ, would be an interesting choice. <laughs> I'd like to ask him a few questions, you know. How did you get to Egypt, Joseph? Where did you stay? You know, what, what, what did you think about, you know, uh, the boy Jesus growing up? You know, etc., etc. Lots of stuff I'd like to know. Anyway, um, in the Surah of Yusuf, it tells the story for its moral purposes. The Quran is not rehearsing a sort of chronological, historical account of the story of Joseph. It's a metaphysical document about the, you know, the pressures put on Joseph to um, actually have an affair with, with his employer's wife, Potiphar, uh, the priest of Ra, or uh, a vizier to the pharaoh, had a wife, um, Zuleika, and she is trying to seduce Joseph and, you know, wants to make love with him. And he, he's a very handsome young man and he refuses. So in revenge, she then accuses him falsely of trying to seduce her and has him put in prison where he languishes. And so, so really that stands for all kind of people that are falsely accused. Um, which does tragically happen, you know. Um, and anyway, I won't go on about it. Listen to the commentary. It's on my Green University website, or will be soon. But um, the rest of the commentary on the Quran is on there. And um, the, the irony, the synchronicity is that here I am working in depth on Joseph, and here is this guy called Joseph getting elected president in the US, which is like today's Egypt. It's the modern flesh pits of, you know, um, every desire you want can be, you know, satisfied, and it's it's got cities called Memphis and so on. It's it's like the Egypt of today. It's It's got the whole history of Egyptianizing Freemasons that set it all up, and... Um, and, and here's Joseph, um, who's really, I mean, I know that Trump has uh, demonized him as a sort of old hack around Washington. He's not really. He was a liberal in the best sense of the word from the, the early generation. Um, you know, he's, he's almost a link back to the Kennedy era. And you can see these pictures of him in the 70s, um, a young, enthusiastic, bright new uh, senator trying to, um, yeah, to to move America in a liberal direction. And of course, they've been up against the hard right, they've been up against Nixon uh, ever since Kennedy was assassinated. You know, the juggernaut of the American military state has been pushing in a different direction. Under Kissinger, it was supporting extreme right-wing forces in Central America. It was, it was, it was acting unethically and illegally in, in, um, in the days of Nixon. <clears throat> and it was bombing mass bombings of Cambodia and so on. This has all come out. Historians have discovered the horrors of it all. And I think, you know, Biden has, has been there trying to keep his faith with, with liberal America in the best sense of the word. And um, finally, it's, it's come through, for not just for him, but for, for all of us. And, um, yeah, bless him. Let's see what he can do. And... Anyway, at the end of the speeches, there was that beautiful firework display and, and music and Coldplay, you know, the, the song about the stars. I mean, it's unbelievably moving, actually. And if you weren't moved by that, um, well, you have a heart of stone or you're from a different planet. Um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> thank you. Um, now I want to talk about the fallout, you know, what is the Trump fallout going to be? Will he go peacefully? Um, I believe he will have to. I mean, constitutionally, he's lost this election. There will be attempts to, you know, contest some issues, but I think logic says that, no, he's lost the election, and what happens when somebody loses in a democracy is you step down. So I, th I don't think he will, even he will dare to do otherwise. Um, so I think he will go. Um, he, 
What he will do in the future, I haven't got a clue. I mean, there are legal issues. He might well be prosecuted when he steps down. I think he will go to court. I think he has trodden on so many toes. He's, he's sailed so close to the wind of illegality and crossed the line that he is going to end up in court at some point. And nobody can predict what will happen. Um, you know, legal process needs to take, take its place. Um, I was also interested in, in noting, I think it's true, I mean, I haven't double-checked, fact-checked, but like it popped up everywhere, that Putin has also announced he's resigning or he's stepping down, not contesting the next elections. The timing of that was very interesting, actually. Um, people have always commented on there seems to be a close link between Trump and Putin. And um, I'd, I'd always thought, I think like many people, I'd assumed that... that um, the reason Trump had, had been so pro-Russia in his policies um, and, um, you know, was because Putin had something on him, you know, some dirty photographs, God knows what, you know, in that, in that world of blackmail politics, um, you know, all things are possible. But one assumed that, that um, Trump had something on Putin and had said, look, you know, um, if you... Um, Sorry, that Putin had something on Trump and therefore it said, toe the line, mate, or, or we're going to uh, release all this stuff. It's, it's, you know, I think it's probably true. Um, but I think, I think what, I, what occurred to me was maybe it's the other way around as well. Maybe Trump also has something on Putin, um, like similar stuff, you know, black magic rituals in the Kremlin, God knows what, you know, <laughs> the mind boggles. Um, but, and maybe with CIA, you know, blah, blah, they, they've got some stuff on Putin. And, and so what, what's happening is that Putin is saying, it's like his cover, Trump, is now fallen. And, and therefore they're going to go together. Forgive me if I'm wrong, you know, I, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not making um, allegations because one doesn't know. I'm just asking a question, really. Why would Putin announce his stepping down at the same time as Trump? He's signalling something, um, but why, you know? Um, <clears throat> interesting. Let's keep watching that space. Um, there are going to be quite a lot of Trump supporters that are not going to accept it very well. This, the Trump phenomenon is like a cult. It is a kind of, um, in the worst sense of the term, sort of new age cult. Um, it's irrational, and it 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 um, and and it's it's more than that actually. It's anti rational, um, and and I want to just explain what I mean by that. So. Um, The, the kind of people that, that support Trump and, and you know, uh, run for him are people that are deeply, deeply into the QAnon conspiracy theory stuff. Um, they may pretend it or gloss over, but essentially their worldview is, is totally Manichaean. There's absolute good, which is Trump and his supporters, and then there's absolute evil, which is anyone that opposes them, which is anyone that's like liberal, Biden-esque, democratish and and all things left of there so socialists you know social democrats um, god god forbid communist type people um you know they're all like literally demonized as devils and so it's a very manichaean worldview in which this small group of trumpists are now taking on and they call this the i don't know what they call it they call it the you know the swamp the deep state uh, the forces of evil, the cabal. Um, along with that is the allegation that it's that these people are so evil they're doing, um, you know, extreme paedophilia. Not just like liking young people, but no, um, you know, gross, indecent, violent sexual exploitation of young people to the point of murder. And then they're accusing mainstream liberal people like. Actually, the Clintons, like 
um, anyone who's vaguely liberal in American politics, and like the Prime Minister of my other country, Trudeau, of being in this secret cabal. Okay, so that's... <clears throat> finally, it's been taken down off Facebook. These conspiracy theories have been floating around for the last um, few years, and these Trumpites seem to literally believe it. Um, I find it shocking, and I mean, I've gone into it, and you know, as a scholar, an academic who's interested in conspiracy theories, um, I'm not denouncing all conspiracy theories as false. You know, I'm not. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying it's really important that we distinguish between true and false ones and that we have to develop a sort of robust intellectual muscle that can do that and, and have criteria for selection. Now, the problem is that um, our education systems in, I think, America, Britain, elsewhere, are not giving us sufficient um, thinking power to be necessarily able to do that. Because the sophistication with which the conspiracy theories are being advanced is so sophisticated, using high technology and stuff, that um, you know that it's hard for normal teachers, intellectuals, scholars like myself to kind of keep up to counter it. Um, and and no doubt that story is going to continue. You know, the the people that generated the QAnon and all its related conspiracy theories. I'm not going to go away, they're going to keep going, and you're going to get spun all kinds of further lies about Biden, the Democrats, and I, I find that all very sad. Um, I think legislation needs tightening up uh, in America and in Britain, which is rife with it too. Um, and I, I think that's something that the Democrat government and the incoming government should concentrate on, is sort of tightening up this covert warfare that's been going on, this information warfare. Um, and the other thing that I found shocking about the, the Trump rhetoric and, and campaigning and all the rest of it is, is the blatant appeal to white supremacism, the sort of neo-Nazi bandwagon, the Ku Klux Klan types all supporting him. I find that deeply disturbing and worrying. And as a historian, I take a long-term view of all that. And I want to share a few things I've been reflecting on and finding out, which I think puts the whole thing in a different light. Um, the history of slavery is, is you know, a tragic um, factor in, in, in all this. I'm reading a really important book by um, one of the best British historians, Simon Sharma, who is a colleague of mine, great writer. He not only does really good historical research, he also writes the books really well. He wrote a great history of the French Revolution called Citizens. Um, <clears throat> and, and now he's written this amazing book called Rough Crossings, which is a history of the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade, and its impact on American history and British. And above all, at the time of the American Revolution in the 1770s and 1780s, what Simon Sharma has discovered is really interesting. Okay, he's discovered that, um, that when the War of Independence, so-called, broke out in the American colonies, the um, American rebels or revolutionaries, whatever you want to call them, were absolutely determined to, to, to keep slavery as it was. It was the basis of a lot of their economic power in the South, particularly in the Carolinas and, and, you know, the southern states, Virginia. And they were benefiting from slavery. There was no question in their minds that the War of Independence was any kind, any kind of good news for the slaves. No, it was, it was just business as usual. Most of the signatures, in fact, probably all of the signatures of the Declaration of Independence were all slave owners. Um, with small or large holdings, they just took it as red. It was the way things were. And there was no way they were going to give it up. Um, one or two little li liberal voices were peeking up in, in uh, Massachusetts and sort of New England saying, well, maybe slavery's wrong, you know. Maybe we should get rid of it when we have our independence from the UK. But they were snuffed out mercilessly by counter-propaganda. Uh, from the kind of conservative um, um, revolutionaries that wanted uh, independence 
Um, now, the paradox here, the British, who were trying desperately to keep the colony, you know, within the bigger picture of the British Empire, um, had become more liberal by then. In two specific regards, we had made a pact with the American Indians west of the Appalachians through Canada, inheriting the French holdings, whereby we'd promised these Indians not to colonise their lands. We would have trading forts, we would send parties down and trade and stuff, but we weren't going to do mass settlement. No, thank you very much. We were happy with the Appalachian, um, you know, east of the Appalachian colonies. Now, the... the um, Landowners of Virginia and and you know the colonies didn't like that at all. They they wanted just to move west and conquer Indian lands. They couldn't do that as long as the British still ran the show. And one of the unspoken, unwritten, undocumented reasons for the revolution was to kick off the British sovereignty, boot them out, and then they had no legal or moral uh, hold on moving west and conquering Indian lands, which is what they proceeded to then do after having won their revolution, so-called, um, and using Washington, who was a land surveyor and who was very much active on that frontier. Um, and, you know, he was typical of the type, Virginia gentleman wanting land in the west, stopped by, by British sense of morality and, and they'd given their word to the Indians that they wouldn't colonise, so... Well, to hell with that, we'll kick the British out. So that was one aspect whereby the revolution was not as progressive as you might think. It was an anti-Indian land grab. The second aspect is that the British were also less keen on slavery by now. There were court cases in London. There was a man called Granville Sharp who was very keyed up legally on, on slavery. It was not only immoral, but it was illegal. He discovered in old Elizabethan clauses that any slave anywhere in the world that stepped foot on British soil was declared free. Slavery was unconstitutional, was this argument. <coughs> Gradually, this, this was winning minds in the liberal intelligentsia of London. Even King George III was thinking, hmm, you know, maybe slavery isn't such a good idea. Granville Sharp was also a musician who was entertaining the king on the Thames. He had a sort of... Um, little orchestra that used to go on a barge and play to the king and queen. And <coughs> in so the upshot of this was that in during the early years of the War of Independence, lots of slaves wanted to escape to the British lines. They wanted to come and surrender to the British forces because they were sick of being slaves. <coughs> they were being brutalised. And, I mean, the life of a slave was not a sort of romantic... Uncle Tom's cabin, you know, um, gob of the wind type. Yes, mammy, you know, it was it was nasty, brutish, and short. Slaves were often whipped to death. They were hung. They were they were brutalized. I mean, uh, women, young young women, were raped um, routinely by the white masters. Um, I mean, raped as in forced to have sex. You know. Um, so that was, that was the situation of the real slaves. Um, they were denied reading and writing. They were not allowed to read the Bible. They didn't know how to read the Bible. Even if they were interested in Christianity, there was no um, like tender evangelization going on. So the British felt, um, you know, maybe these rebels and their slaves, um, when the slaves started coming over to the British ranks, they said, and, and a couple of the generals gave um, declarations, that they would receive their freedom. They would be granted freedom if they made it to the British ranks. And, if, and quite a few thousand did. And what Simon Sharma does is he documents this process in detail, which, I mean, I'm a historian, you know, I've studied <coughs> American history, world history, <coughs> European and British history in, in considerable depth. I didn't know all this. I ought to have known it, you know. It's one of those amazing things when you discover